Okay, greetings, brethren. Thanks for joining us here on Shepherd's Voice magazine on YouTube. So I've got a news flash for you. We are saved by grace, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Okay, that's not a news flash. But I was thinking about faith and works this past couple of weeks. Because, and, and believe it or not, I'm not going to go into the book of James. I'm going to spare us that. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's in here, but we're not going to actually go there today. Uh, so, but we are certainly to start when we're baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. There's an expectation for us to do good works. So it certainly is there. And do the will of God. So I was thinking about think, talk, having a little talk about our participation in God's works. I want to talk about our participation in the way of where's our participation in terms of salvation? Because it's, it's, it's in there. So I started thinking about that and I started looking a little more closely at it. And perhaps I have a few helpful things to discuss in regards to that in doing the works of God. And so we'll look we'll at it a couple of different ways. So we'll just let's start it here. We'll just launch with a scripture here from Ephesians. For we are his workmanship. This is Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we are to be doing good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, that's Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. I remember discussing, uh, having discussed a couple of feasts ago, and I was having a little impromptu Bible study, and I think I might have mentioned this before, and we certainly have on this channel. I asked the question, well, what's a good work? What is, what's, what work is good? Well, what work is acceptable to God? Well, we're supposed to be doing good works. And, and he quoted this verse here. And it's right, so, but I'm looking at what are, what, I said, but what are the good works? Uh, we're entering our Father's works. We're doing His works. So when we do works, we're actually participating in his plan, according to his will. So we are to do good works that further his will. So that's our participation, and we're getting more, and as time goes on, we get more and more involved in it as we understand God's will, as he reveals himself to us. And we want to be able to do that and not ignore it, and not go off and do other kinds of works, and thinking that they're for God. And so we're going to touch on that a little bit today, too. And see, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus Christ said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So that's very clear what the expectation is. And I also read this to you, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. It's not like nobody who says to me, Lord, Lord, because many will, because some are just just didn't have the same amount of revelation or participation or their circumstances and such that. Um, this is something Jesus Christ can judge. So it's not everyone, he says, but he didn't say absolutely nobody. I just want to kind of highlight that here. You know, so, but if we're cognizant of this, we're cognizant of the scripture, if we have God's Holy Spirit and we're moving along as faithfully and abiding in him, we need to be considering what it is to be doing God's will. So how do we participate in doing God's will and his works? What of our own ability can we do in participating? What of our own ability? Like, how do we do this? How do we get engaged? Because obviously there's a part of our human will that's involved here. So this question came up, in a sense, to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And this here is going to take us to, I believe, John chapter 6 and verse 28. I believe this is where it is. In fact, I'm, I think I better, I might want to just check that here while I have my Bible so I don't send this off in the wrong direction. All right. Okay. Well, let's pick it up here in verse 28. So this came after the, the feeding of the fish and of the bread of the 5,000. Let's pick it up here, here again in verse 28. Now, this is what was asked of him. What shall we do, chapter 6, that we may work the works of God? What can we do? 
and Christ's answer is important to us and very relevant. We should always have it in our minds. At least I do. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So it's, a, it's, it's quite an st astonishing statement to me. I just don't just read through it. Oh yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, it takes work to believe. I find. God gives us a gift of faith, and belief comes from that. So we start to, we want to believe. Believe in him whom he sent. Believe in Jesus Christ, that he saves. And the full spectrum and the multifaceted Savior that we have. So it takes work to believe, though. It, it does. And it takes work to help others believe. And it takes work to help others to keep on believing. This is a process that we're always involved in. So it's the work of him. It's just not a one-time thing. This is something that is carried on throughout our life, that you believe in him. Because he is the one. He is the one who saves. It all centers around Jesus Christ. There's no other bypass, no other way around it. It's that. And it takes work. It takes effort. Later on, chapter 6, verse, let's pick it up here, I think, in verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So let's just a couple of comments about this. You know, I haven't seen the Son of God. I haven't seen him. But what he's talking about here is when he said, he who sees the Son. Um, he's really talking about beholding the Son in, is, the same, is, in, is the same thing as believing in him here. Okay? Jesus meant beholding with the eyes of faith is what he's talking about. And this is what we have. We have through the eyes of faith that we behold our Savior. He comes into view. His, he is the expression of God. So now he is in view. So what, we have a very strong assurance in here of Christ's hold on us. I mean, we could always reject that, but heaven forbid. But he has the strength we have this assurance is basically not a feeble hold. It's not our feeble hold on Christ, but his strong grip on us. So it's the power of the resurrection. Jesus Christ has a very strong grip on us as believers. As long as we continue to abide in him, as long as we do that, he's got a very strong grip. So there's a good assurance in here. But there's, Jesus Christ balanced a couple of truths here very wonderfully, if we look at it closely. Salvation has its divine sovereignty, right? Salvation has in it his divine sovereignty and who he calls and who he chooses and when and how. And also human responsibility. So we have those two truths there. And Jesus Christ balances them well. And oftentimes I'm trying to rebalance that equation, say from an engineering point of view, like God's sovereignty and our human responsibility in this. Even though God chooses, we still need to believe in Jesus Christ. That's the work that we are doing. That's the work of the believer, the fundamental work. And everything expands from that. That's what I want to, to emphasize here. Now let's look. This is, I want to, had a thought I want to share through all this, because uh, I'm meditating on some of these questions that come up. Now let's look even behind the will of God in order to capture our participation in the work of God and understanding his will a little bit more. I want to go a little bit farther into this so we can 
perhaps get a you know a better feel for doing God's works, like believing in Him. And what's the motivation is really what I'm getting to. What is the motivation? So if we're going to believe and work to believe, we need the gift of faith. And this is something that's in God's hands. He gives us the gift of faith. It's a gift from God. And with regards to faith, we're going to broaden the idea of faith a little bit in this message. Maybe maybe quite a bit. Depends. Or broaden the reality of faith. I'm not going to give us some updated definition or anything or create something new. I just want to broaden, broaden our, the reality of faith that we have. So, what's the motivation behind all this? What's the motivation behind God's will? We talked about God's will. What's the motivation even behind that? And that's what I want that I start to think about a little bit more. And, and in, in case in various ways we talked about this be, before in other, in other sermons. But God wants to be glorified. And in that, there's, there's a number of things he, that he has known. We can go look right from Genesis. The great man is in his own image. He said, fruitful, be fruitful, multiply, and, and spread out. He wanted his image to be spread out over the earth. And it's reinforced elsewhere in the Old Testament. My name shall be known. It's my name and my reputation. He wants to be known, and he expects to be glorified by his creation. So, God wants to be known. This is part of the glory of God. And that he can share his love and receive love. So that his life, his own life, is glorified. His own life is enhanced. And we could participate in something like that, which is quite astounding. And when that happens, we end up being glorified as well. We benefit. If we are aligned with this, we can start seeing the benefits as well, especially in the future when we receive a new body, when we become spiritual beings. But without this, without God being glorified, without his life being number one and first, and without God being for himself first, without that there can't be anything. So it all starts from there. He purposed it in himself in Ephesians 1 to have all things brought through together in Christ. So there was a plan involved to make this happen. So... Without any of this, there's nothing. There's really nothing. So we want to have our motivation the same essentially as his. That he is glorified. We want to be aligned with his will. That he is number one. And we, oftentimes people talk this way. God's got to be number one in your life. God's got to be number one in your life. But I, I kind of want to really explore really what that is. Like, what's your motivation? Can you, can you it's, it's what, I was, what I was doing, is perhaps just reevaluating and doing a lot of my motivation. What's, what's causing me to think certain things, or what's causing me to, to act? And just looking at my own life. And I think that's a good idea that we, we assess these kinds of things. You know, we were to take heed, and that's part of it. So our motivation wants to be aligned with God, and we get aligned if we subject ourselves to him and his wisdom and his plan. So we have to do this. This means always speaking the truth about him. We, we want to say the truth about God. We don't want to mislead people. Not lies. We don't want to say lies about God. Many do. And we certainly want to avoid it. But not just, you know, always speaking the truth about him, not just about him, but what he's doing and how he's doing it. And this is here, this is something that's really caused uh, some consternation for me. Um, and I'll mention a couple of points as we go along here. Because this is where some people declare, based on whatever limited information they have of God, or they put together of scriptures and declare, this is what God's doing, and this is why he's doing it. God is mad, and I'm going to, and this is why, he's, this is why the, all these things are happening. And I, I just want to touch on that uh, briefly in a minute. And that's not speaking the truth in love, as Paul tells us to do. So this is what we need to focus on and make sure. What's our conversation? 
What are we sharing? What are we saying? What are we posting on the internet? What am I talking about here? I want to be aligned with God's will. So, we want to have this motivation. And, this, and a proper motivation is sustainable as well. Because we want to sustain our walk. We just don't want to stop for, for any, <laughs> any length of time and then try to start it up again when things aren't going right. So, we want something sustainable. Now here's the definition that is often used, and it's, it's a correct definition, but I want to expand on it. So we go to Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith, and this is the verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the words, the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things, <coughs> Where, excuse me, faith, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which were visible. All right, I think I changed translations on me here. That's why I have to back up a little bit. Let's talk about the invisible here. The things, like, for the things not seen. What, is, what, what are the things that are not seen? Well, we say, okay, well, we don't see the heavenlies. We don't see these things. We don't see the spiritual realm. Okay, we can certainly describe it that way, but I'd rather not do it that way because it's not seen. But what faith does, and it says here, hope for, this is the hope of the realization of what we already have. Okay, the full realization of that will come. But it's not a hope of the world, but hope we things get better. Hope God fixes this. You know, hope the economy gets better. Hope there's no war. Hope the disease goes away. That's not the, the Christian hope. And we talk about that, but it's always good to re, kind of reinterject these things. But what I'm seeing in this verse, and what I've my meditation on it recently, in terms of motivation, in terms of faith and God's will and doing his works, just kind of trying to tie all these things together and, and, and examining myself in this whole, that whole picture through scripture, is the realization, and I think we all need to have this, that there is something I'm connected to that is so much greater than me and so much greater than the creation we see. And this is really essential for, to what I want to communicate today. So step back and think. There's something that I'm connected with now, by faith, by what God has done. There's something so much greater, something so much greater than me, so much greater than what we see. And when I could grasp that more, therein lies the motivation. That helps us with the motivation. We'll flush it out a little bit more as we go along. When God gives you the gift of faith, when he gives you that gift, he's effectively communicating that there's so much more and greater than beyond normal sight. And God gives us that ability. He says there's something more. And he's interested in us in participating in that something so much more and so much greater. And therein lies, I think, a very strong sense of motivation. Because I can look around. People get motivated, right, motivated, in things larger than themselves. It's just a natural thing to generally happen, like getting behind their country, for example. Some, or their home team. And I like to root before, you know, root for the home team or Chicago Cubs or, or the Bears and all these kinds of things. And, and I enjoy that. Uh, or people want to get behind their, their leader. Or they want to get behind uh, a big church organization with uh, lots of uh, resources and these kinds of things. They say, well, this is bigger than me, so I want to get behind it. And that's what we do as human beings. We, we want to 
be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We want to belong, this is, this is another way of saying it. So I, we see this, and it's a motivating, people act on this. When they have this, when they see something larger than themselves, they act on it. The faith that God gives us, though, it, you know, is intended to motivate us in something that is so large that will not fail. All these things on earth will fail. Nations will fail. Teams lose. Okay, I can tell you that for, for certain. Uh, and popular leaders fail. They stumble. And if I was a leader of a country, I'd mess a bunch of stuff up too over a period of time. I mean, we just... It's just the, the human, just human limitations and, and all this in a very complicated word, uh, world. Or they put church too much faith in a church leader and these kinds of things will happen. We're not going to get into that. But faith gives us us connections with God's motivation. And what God is doing is not going to fail. That's for certain. It will not fail. So we should be motivated to be part of something that will never fail. And faith is that recognition. And we need to always act on that. And that is part of the, how the that's the expression of the works we do. So we want to be aligned with God's motivation because we, we want to peer into it. And we're kind of doing that today. And we a little expanded view on faith, as, as what I was just talking about there, to, gives us the realization that there's something so much more than we see. There's something so much more than us, as even as a people. And one day we'll have that real, uh, full realization, but God has already given us enough to fully participate. So even though we peer through the glass darkly, as, as Paul puts it, we already can be excited when we get that sense of God in our life. So think in terms of motivation. Take for yourself time today or whenever you have a chance you know, to audit your motivation. Like what's what's driving you? And we'll, we're going to talk about a couple other things in here to watch out for. But what's your motivation? Because faith can get, get hijacked. Some people's faith can be hijacked, and scriptures speak to that. When our intention, okay, this is just the words I'm going through kind of my notes here. But faith is hijacked when our attention or our interpretation of things is based on the physical. Suddenly we take our attention and evaluate ourselves. We evaluate everything in terms of what we see physically. And we may say, oh no, we don't do that. Well, sure we do. I see, I see this all the time. It's based on something physical or temporal. And often interpret the physical as, as a motivation. Okay, this is the reason. This is, this is what's happening, and we're going to be doing this for God and all these kinds of things, and I can see it happening here. I've got the numbers and all these kinds of things. Um, uh, that, uh, I don't think you'll find it there. But looking at the physical too much, I mean, we do look at the physical. I have to deal with things. Um, but to find that motivation to serve God, you're really not going to find it too much in the physical realm. Okay. In terms of its of the broader spectrum of what we're doing, right? It's not saying ignore the physical and the physical needs and these kinds of things, but there's something we need to step back and have a more rooted ability to be full participants in this. So we're motivated for God's glory. We're motivated for Him. We're motivated for His enhancement of His own life, and we can be some part of it. But we want to understand it's so much greater than what's going what we see here. So faith can get derailed or go undeveloped when we put faith in ourselves or some vision of ourselves in the faith. We just get this wrong idea of ourselves and who we are in the faith. We just start to be we start to develop our own security in the faith kind of thing. When our security comes from God, from Jesus Christ. And it begins to emerge when things go undeveloped and the faith gets derailed or train wrecked or shipwrecked, something in something the nature when the physical starts to creep in too much. It emerges by, by various symptoms. It's usually the symptoms we can detect. 
And those symptoms are like arrogance and pretense and need for control, respect, and pretentiousness, fear and pretentiousness go together as well. So all these things that can happen. So in a sense, and this is what one of these things I want us to keep an eye out for ourselves, do that audit. Problems occur when Christians get motivated for themselves in the faith. They, they start getting, it's really not even in the faith. I'm just saying those when believers, let's just put it this way, problems will occur when believers get motivated for themselves. And maybe we'll have a couple examples here if, 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 I, if I capture it properly. In Matthew chapter 16, I think here in verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is for what if a man profited, if he shall gain the whole world, all this physical, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, the idea of saving one's own life, um, maybe a couple examples or something like that effect might kind of help us understand where Jesus Christ is getting to. It's some sort of meth meth way of preserving preserving one's own life. So there's something we need to let go of and grab a new motivation. Not motivation to be motivated for ourselves, but to be motivated for God and his wishes and his, or for his will. And that's what we want to capture as we do our, and I trust we will and you will, our little audit of what's going on with ourselves. I remember a case, um, a fellow came to church one day and heard a message on faith and love, right? But he left disappointed. He left disappointed. And why? Why would he leave disappointed? Somebody who came to church and, and wanted to, I guess, hear the word of God. But he left disappointed. Why? Why did he leave disappointed? <clears throat> Because he came wanting to be a better father. I would imagine he was having trouble at home or something like that. But he came to church and said, you know, and when he left, he said, um, I want to, I was hoping to learn how to be a better father. And you can, you can say any way, I want to be a better mother or whoever, whoever comes in with this same idea. Now, that's not what we do here directly. As and I'm not here to. This is these are some steps you can do to be a better father or a better son or a better mother. This this is what we teach, and we have all these uh, seminars and all these kinds of things to do that. But this is not what the gospel. This is not what's central to the gospel is about. That somebody would have come in to be motivated for themselves, really. And it's it sounds good, and it it is good. I'm taking anything away from that fact. But there's something more intrinsic to the gospel than coming in and learning how to have a better life for yourself. That's not what we do. That's not what we teach, or we shouldn't be teaching. Now, a believer can certainly become a better parent, or a friend, or a son, or a citizen of a country by virtue of being becoming a believer and being obedient to God. But those are actually secondary and tertiary things that follow after the fact, or can follow after the fact. So I hope that kind of gives one example. I like to go for the ones that seem most innocent and so right, because this is where we can stumble. We're here, we exist for the glory of God, and it has to all stem out from there. Everything else, good things will happen be, because of it, but that needs to be central first. We can't be just motivated walking around, motivated for ourselves in this, in this walk. <clears throat> now Jesus Christ said, I have come so that you, or they, I was paraphrasing, 
would have life more abundantly. And we think abundantly, we generally want to go to, yes, you know, physical things, and maybe, maybe there's an element there. Have more life more abundantly, have more stuff, and more family, and more friends, and happiness, and these kinds of things. But Jesus Christ is talking about something far more intrinsic when he speaks, more intrinsic to what life's about in terms of God's point of view. Because an abundant life is having all our needs met in Christ that all our needs are met for significance and security, that we have God's love and we have security in him and cannot be taken away that these needs are met and we cannot take it while, away while, while we abide in Christ. If you abide in Christ, those things cannot be taken away from you. We just want to recognize that. We want to certainly recognize that. When that's what Jesus Christ speaks about for when he talks about that we might have life more abundantly. So we don't have to always worry about losing something. Because a lot of the things we do during the day is we're, we're trying to keep stuff. <laughs> and so, and that's the way it goes. Now, and so all living extends outward of a believer's acceptance by God. It all starts extending out from there. All right. And I think this is captured and happens when the believer sees beyond themselves, when we see beyond ourselves and be motivated by the glory of God. God reveals himself to him, reveals himself to us by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed by faith. And so in a very real sense, okay, let's say it this way, so we remember, this is not about you. <laughs> this is not about you. You. It's not about me. It's about God being first. And from that, your needs. After that, if God being first, then your needs, okay, your needs start to come, your proper needs start to become in better focus, what you truly need. So we want that motivation behind that. We want to be motivated by, by God's will and doing his works and that his glory stepping further back that you know, his will that he is glorified and he is known and his life is enhanced by his family so god must be first in this so there's real ramifications in this jesus christ said himself first seek the kingdom of god and god's glory and his righteousness okay first seek seek the reign of god that's what he's talking about the kingdom of god i mean you're looking around Where's the kingdom of God? Where's the where's headquarters? Where's all these things? Where's where's the new Jerusalem? We can't see it. It's not what he's talking about here. It's always in context. First, seek the reign, okay, of God in your life, and God's righteousness. Then these things will happen. Good things will happen on account of it, because God is being pleased <laughs> when He sees it. Here's the other thing to watch out for, and I'm going to read a parable here that this is where we really want to, you know, this is where we do that self-assessment a little bit. But it's, it's, this is kind of an essential, it's kind of one of those scary parables, but, you know, it has, I think, an application in what we're talking about today. This is in Luke chapter 11 and verses, uh, I think, 24 to 25, okay? It's called the parable of the demon invasion. It may not even be a parable, but this is to say the kingdom of God is like this. It's not that kind of a parable. But let's just call it a parable. <clears throat> parable of a demon invasion. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he roams through waterless places in search of rest, and finding none, he says, I'll return to my house which I left. And when he has come to it, he finds the place swept and clean. Then he goes and takes over seven other spirits more evil than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. All right. So let's just kind of talk about this a little bit, and there's a couple ways of looking at this. Uh, but they're, they're, they're basically the same, but I want to try to help us along here the best I can. You know, if a person a person has, by God's grace, is able to sweep clean sin from their life and just keep it clean. If sin enters, it keeps it clean. Keeps it clean. Keeps it clean. All swept out of his life. Praise, you know, needs to go to God. 
if it's by God's grace, by God's grace this happens, praise needs to go to God, not to yourself or to somebody else. It needs to go to God. The motivation was for God's will to happen. So that's a good thing. But it has to be God needs to be central in this process. So again, something greater than us has the, is the only way. So if we're going to have a swept clean, God is, it has to be done by somebody greater and outside of us. Something greater. And this is what we never want to forget in all this. Otherwise, if we forget, or our motivation was wrong in the or misplaced and misguided in the first place to get the, get the sin out of life, to clean things up, to get life back in order again. This is an open door for pride. Slept clean, but now it's got to be replaced with something. So what's it going to be replaced with? If it's being done properly, it should be replaced by humility and gratitude towards God and an alignment more, again, with his will. If it's slept clean, we want to make sure it's replaced with something. Otherwise, it's open up to problems. But it has to be replaced with the right thing. Otherwise, we will have it be replaced with problems. So in this context that he was given, these religious observant people, okay, good thing, I guess, a good thing, had allowed their lives all swept clean, but empty. And it was done by their effort that they put into this. They were motivated for themselves. As you see, a lot of these teachers, they were looking for respect and all these kinds of things. And they wanted to be shown that they were fasting and all these kinds of things. But if done by their effort, you get filled with doubt in the end of it, filled with doubt, scorn, and pride. You know, that they follow the law, you know, they they follow the law to, to whatever ability they had it right. You know, that's a good thing. Not against that. But their lives were slept clean and ornate, but empty. And the emptiness was filled with this pride and cynicism in these characters. And this is what Jesus Christ is getting at here. And his talk about the demon invasion. You know, in modern times, we see those who come to terms with, say, the truth of God, they get all excited, or they, re they receive some information, and now they're studying and they're doing, doing well, I suppose, and just getting excited for the walk and the work that they can see, for example. Well, you know, just everybody has their own, a certain experience in coming to God. <clears throat> and they get embraced the truth, they get excited for it. But here's where things get derailed, and Jesus Christ warns of this elsewhere. But instead of setting their minds on the things above, they set their minds on the things of the earth. It starts to shift in that direction. We see some of these ideas come up. We see it being taught, all these concerns for the earth or the world that we live in, concern for the nation. And this is why I flag them, we flag them up on this channel every so often. This is why we flag them up, because this is the danger that can occur if we set our minds worrying about earthly things. I did an article on the knowledge of evil, <clears throat> knowledge of, of good and evil. I can't remember the exact title, but I'll put it in the, in the links below. There's maybe a couple of uh, articles that relate, can relate to this, this message today. And I'll, I'll put them in there. But the knowledge of evil, you know, there's pride in this. When they start to look at the world, if you spend too much time, not if you spend not enough time thinking about the things above and looking at God's motivation, looking to God's glory, speaking the truth and love and these kinds of things, if we that's getting replaced or being hijacked by more and more. Uh, ideas about what's going on in the world and the knowledge of evil. And many preachers getting up in front of them, brethren, 
and putting all this stuff out there and all these worries and fears. It's not good. And teachers have been doing this. But we flag it out. Then we see the pride and arrogance come about. This is what comes in. So the latter state is worse than the first. This is nothing to take lightly. And they get very defensive on some of these positions when it comes to the world because it was very, these things could really uh, cause all kinds of strife within a group, a body of people. Even not just physically present, but throughout um, the Church of God at large, if you would, the Assembly of God. Because now everybody's communicating from quickly and remotely on Facebook or emails or other social media sites, putting all, all kinds of material out there. And you can see some debates go back and forth. I generally try to stay out of this. There's a comment recently that uh, came about where um, this ministry put together a 60-page article on, on anti-vaxxation. 60 pages this, this ministry put out. Um, and I think it's called The Church at Home. Let's put this, put this out. And we flagged that ministry out before. 60 pages. It's not, that's not the church's prerogative. That's a, it's a choice of other individuals to make on their own. We're not going to get in here and, and start to dictate what people should be doing and putting fear on them and regarding their own personal health. That's not part of the Christian conversation. It's up to you what you want to do. But anyway, this is what gets shared around. And it's usually, coupled with that, is this pride and arrogance. And they offended. I saw an article recently on a Sabbatarian it was a magazine, and was I was reading you know, this, this, this publication for really the first time, and there was one article in there, and it was a, really a rant. It was just a rant. Now, his problem was with the amount of abortions that are going on in the world. And it is something, certainly, to be upset about. If you think about it, you know, it's quite, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very uh, unpleasant the numbers in terms of abortions. So he's very upset about that, and I can understand. But then he says COVID-19 was God's punishment or anger on the world. And this is why we have COVID-19 going out there. And we're, he's, God is doing it because of all the abortions. Now, I might write that magazine when I get a chance and say, maybe we should step back here because there's some other things in this article too that were, you know, God's going to come and he's going to, we're all going to come before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, that's not what Paul was talking about there. But God is, our God is not a passive aggressive God that he's going to release a, some pestilence and really most of the world doesn't know. If, if that's what he wanted to do, you say, this is wrong and this needs to end or this, Send a punishment. He's not do. He doesn't do it in the passive aggressive way. Because this would this 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 would be a, if God was trying to get our attention like this. I mean, wow. Um, no, he's not. This virus came up, and God maybe hadn't probably had nothing to do with it. We will know if God's wrath comes on the earth for whatever whatever timing whatever he's going to do. We would know. We won't be writing an article and ranting about it. And COVID-19 doesn't fit that bill. He's not passive aggressive. I hope they'll recognize that I'm mad about this through this disease. See, that's mischaracterizing God. And here, that's not doing his work. Because we need to speak the truth about him and what he's doing and why he's doing it. When we see things like that and other other messages like that, uh, that's not doing God's work. In fact, it opposes it. It causes damage. So articles like that shouldn't be published. Among um, other, other things that I have, I, I have seen. So we see, I've talked about some recently, where they're worried about immigrants, all these people coming up from the South. They're a threat to us, us. That's not the gospel message. What happened to the compassion? 
what happened to concern over these things. A nation, as I said before, I think a couple of weeks ago, has the right to defend its borders. But that's not part of the gospel conversation to start demonizing foreign lands and foreigners, foreigners or foreign people in foreign lands around the world and start demonizing them for some reason. It's, it's not what we are called to do. That's not part of God's work. God's going to make a judgment. Let him do it. Let him do it. So, in this, still in light of this demon invasion parable, I want to keep that, you know, I want, don't want that to lose our, I don't want to forget that discussion. We're still in it. So we talked about the pride and start looking at worldly things and getting angry and putting rants out there and get all it causes pride. So the vacuum, the, the, the what was supposed to be cleaned up to serve God, to do his workmanship and doing for doing good works, instead is hijacked by his game replaced by a demon invasion. Not good. Not good. You know, there's also the problem of self-reliance in this. You know, we want to make it so there's a self-reliance in terms of making it better. Or self-reliance, there's too much self-reliance, and trying to do God's works. There's a truth in all this. There's a balance there, but we still need to believe in God. Remember we, earlier how Jesus Christ balanced out God's sovereignty and our, our participation in this, that we believe in him, believe in him. So when we start to go look at this and somehow just simply start to believe in ourself that I am going to overcome by some belief or self-reliance on oneself, that's where things can also get to be a problem. So we can say, well, I'm going to straighten my life out. You know, I'm going to get it right this time. I'm going to turn around my turn my life around. Because it happens in the situation life has come to a point in a believer's life, <clears throat> that if positive changes don't occur, they can suffer a loss. They need to turn it around. They'll, they'll suffer loss of, their, of life, they'll suffer loss of their relationships, and of their uh, respect, or whatever it is, whatever's on the line, and it causes somebody to be motivated. Okay, I'm going to make positive changes now. I'm going to turn things around. And, I, and that's a good thing, to, to, to want to turn things around. But again, again, God it has to be central in any of that. The motivator, the, <clears throat> this, you know, this is a motivator what, when we're about, we can possibly suffer loss. Okay? But we need to find the motivation, something that is greater, greater than what, you can lose something greater. We have to have that. So we find ourselves in these situations. We need to find motivation in seeking God to lead the way. That God is central in turning things around for the back, back the, the backsliding Christian, if you would. <clears throat> That needs to be the motivator still. Yes, we find ourselves in life with situations where I've really screwed up, okay? But to turn it around under our own ability could lead to trouble, as Jesus Christ is telling us here about this <laughs> parable of this demon invasion. It's good to turn things around. I mean, I was just talking to uh, uh, a coworker and he, she basically, we were just talking about things, and and um, he basically told her husband, "You got to quit drinking, or uh, it's me or the drink, kind of thing." And on how serious she was about that, I don't know. But he's been, he hasn't had a drink in over 453 days. She tells me, and lost weight and is doing better. So he just needs to, and he's just doing other things to keep busy, because you got to replace it with something. But they're not believers, okay, in the sense of the word. We can understand that. I'm talking about the believer here. 
which is the, we want to keep that central to us. Because if the motivator is self-preservation, that often doesn't work in the long term or in the midterm. The motivator has to be, we have to motivate us for something so much greater than ourselves, is what I'm repeating. Habits need to be replaced. The bad habit, we need, we need to be, if, God, if the problem is a bad habit, whatever it is, whatever the vices we humans <laughs> seem to acquire, okay? Just removing the habit and being all swept and clean opens the door to a couple of possibilities. So how is this done is really going to, it matters in the first place. Like cleaning things up and all of a sudden, okay, I'm doing well. Okay, well, that's good. Because if God is not central to the process and continues to be throughout the remainder of lifetime on this earth, the result is often a demon invasion. Now, I don't think it's what he's talking about here is really demons in that sense. I mean, he could be, but we see this happening. I've seen this kind of stuff happen anyway. You know, the piety and the goodness that they want others to recognize. Look, I've turned things around. I'm doing good now. But when that isn't recognized, or when that doesn't come, something not so perfect happens. Something causes us to stumble, or we don't quite, we're not achieving, uh, we're not achieving this new, uh, gotten rid of this habit, we haven't fully been successful with it yet, or some other disappointment in life comes along, or something else happens, then it all falls apart. But if God is central to the process, it won't. And there's things, well, now my situation's better, things are improved, I'm no longer under threat of losing or suffering loss, everybody's cool now, it's all good now. <clears throat> um, and then just no longer fearing that loss, kind of just back to the old habits. Because we want something sustainable in this walk, we want to make sustainable change. And what happens there, and I've seen this before, the latter is worse than the former. It just gets worse. Because we need to replace this old self, or these old habits, the old ideas, whatever it is that's going on, whatever's going on in our life, with something greater than ourselves, something greater than before, that's going to motivate us. Something to give us more joy than whatever these, these uh, false ideas of getting joy was in the past. Otherwise, the likelihood of the old habits come back, along with additional problems, more demons, but these pride and arrogance is going to come back, and it'll be worse than the former. God needs to be central. When swept clean, if God's grace is central to this, swept clean, and all is, is made well, right? it needs to be replaced by something, and it needs to be replaced by humility and gratitude and the joy of serving God with the true and correct motivation. You know, Paul recognizes this, and we're not going to read it, but um, in Romans chapter 7. We go to Romans chapter 7. And uh, oh, too many pages back. You know, he talks about the law, and he says, "Well, I don't know how to really capture all. That. I don't want to read all this." But he says, "You know, I I want to do good, but then I can't. Then I I, I fail. I, I want to do better, but then I can't. It comes sin becomes exceedingly sinful." As he talks about it, I'm going to just focus here on the solution. He says here, "O wretched man." that I am, in verse 24, a oh, wretched man that I am, this impossible situation, this impossible situation, I can't make it better for myself, can't do it. Who will deliver me from this body of death? <laughs> All right, something greater than himself, someone greater than himself is the solution. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, exclamation point in my Bible. So then, with my mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he, he's basically saying, and, and there's more here in Romans we can look to, but you know, Christ defeated death, defeated sin. 
So he can. And he's so much greater. And he can save to the uttermost. We should never allow, take away from that. Something greater than ourselves pulls us up. And that has to be central. And our motivation for that, to, uh, what I'm aligning here is our motivation is, again, we can't be just motivated because of the wretched state we're in in life. I, w I want to get to fix this better. I want to you know, do all this and do all this. The motivation for the believer is to think about God's will in this and that he is glorified and that he is central to a recovery process or whatever situation someone finds themselves. And that's what I really want to get here, get to us with this here. So focusing on these worldly things <clears throat> it could be trouble. So Paul recognizes this, and we've discussed it here about too much worldly influences coming in in the church. Like so much worried, oh, Oh, the nation needs to get back to God and, and these kinds of messages. That, that's why I find, and, and Darren and I and others, and, <laughs> and many, of our, many of us are realizing more and more, this is very disconcerting to see these kinds of presentations about getting worried about what the world is, what's going on in the world. Or starting getting crazy ideas about prophecy, speculating what's going on here or here, just continual speculation of what's going on. Uh, that's not doing his works. That's not doing his works. It actually works against us. Now, for me personally, and one of the reasons probably I've reflected on this because I've done, you know, I've done my own personal audits, and I always do, is, you know, especially uh, if I, you know, for myself, you know, we we take this as you do. We take our salvation and our walk very seriously and very personally. And I one of the one of the things as I've realized is that over the last year and a half, you know, when things changed, you know, I was involved in doing many different things and just kind of going through through life and, and doing work and all these things. It's just a sense of watching this thing happen, you know, in real time, watching businesses close, people's lives being shaken up, people in, in death and dying and just all kinds of worry and people being distraught, just watching it happen. Um, and there, a certain sense of despondency started creeping up in me. And I would start to look at the world. I would be spending too much time, I think, looking at what was going on in the world and, and things of that nature. I think so. So I had to take a step back and look at these things. I wasn't really motivated to do, <laughs> to go to work anymore. I didn't really, you know, it was just, it was just kind of getting a, an unhealthy situation, I think. And uh, in doing some reading, I found a nice quote here that made sense, and I kept it, and I just thought I'd include it here. But he says here, despondency arises through the listening to ourselves and our self-assessment, etc. Instead of looking to God, recalling his purposes, living accordingly to our dignity in him, and rediscovering in him our source of power. So I, f I took that very, that was, I thought that this, this gentleman was right, I don't have... Uh, the quote reference in front of me, but it doesn't matter. I'm sure you wouldn't mind. So, you know, recall his purposes. Think about that. So when we do our audit, instead of just going through our own personal self-assessment of what do people think of me and how, how do I fit in or, or uh, things that are like inward, we need to look outward to someone greater than ourselves. It's the only way. So I took something like this to heart and, you know, trying to focus, and I'm sharing this here because, it's, again, it's work, takes work to believe. We have to, <laughs> and it takes work for me to believe, and I have to look at this, and I have to look at my myself over the last year and a half and go, you know, there's some, there's some lessons here to be learned, and we find out more about ourselves when we go through these trials, etc. So there's something there to rejoice about, According to James, I mean, we're not going to go to James and say, look, there's something so much greater. And this is what James and all the apostles and Christ spoke to us about. And all those people of faith, and for whatever measure of faith they had, starting from Abel and onwards, all these people, is that there's 
some intrinsic understanding that is something greater than themselves. And Abel gave his sacrifice because he gave something of value of himself, something of value to him, because there's something greater involved. So even, that's, even that act of faith from back then. So when we recognize that and we see the passion that the people have had for God, they've stumbled in their various ways, that's okay. By faith, God is pleased. If we want to please God, we've got to have faith. And that faith stems from, gives us the proper motivation to serve God and that we can be, you know, we can actually bless Him. <laughs> actually bless Him. So that's why I always, you know, I sometimes go back to repeating various things, various scriptures. And of course, my one of my favorites here, which is very applicable to this message, so I'm going to say it, is Colossians chapter 3, and it's something that, oh yeah, we read it, but then there's so many just get down into the world and get worried about knowledge of evil and what's going on. In first verse of chapter 3, If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. His motivation. Look at his, what God wants to do. What does he want? Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your minds on the things above, not the things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, who is our life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. We set their minds on the things above. Sounds like some very good advice. You know, it's the joy. Jesus Christ in, in, the, in the Beatitudes spoke of a joy. And that joy is the Greek word makarios. Talked about it before and some time ago, I guess. And that's a that's a joy that is with is that is power behind it. The joys in the world and all these kinds of things they, they come and go, but the joy that God gives is something that is indestructible. Even though it may get quenched, and pushed down, it comes and finds you again. And that's the joy that Jesus Christ was speaking about. We always want keep an appreciation of the greater picture than beyond ourselves. I mean, and Paul spoke about it often in various ways, and there's all a number of different scriptures I, can, I thought maybe using, but maybe we'll just conclude simply with 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. So picking up in the context here, but it's okay. In the context about eating and drinking and these kinds of things. Therefore, whatever you, you eat, drink, eat or drink, or whatever you do, Right? So it's just it's beyond this, uh, what sacrifice to idols or not and all these kinds of things. But whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Keep that central in your thinking. All right? Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please, just as, as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, what's his motivation? but the profit of many, that they will be saved. So the motivation behind Paul, as he pours out his, his soul to his hearers, especially in, in Corinth, is that his, he's got the right kind of motivation, that they be, many be saved. He wants to help others believe. And that's the program we're into too. It takes work to believe, and we can see that in Paul of Paul's efforts. And we want to participate on that level. We don't want to make it about ourselves. We want to make it about others and the success of others and not be self-focused on our own personal success because God is the author and finisher of our faith. We can put that much trust in him. We want to, our role is to believe in him and to grasp that great big something so much greater than ourselves, and I think we'll do well if we do that. So I am going to stop right there. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, any questions, go ahead and um, email us, or send us a note. We'll put some links down there below that relates to this topic today. And so thank you for watching. 
Have a good Sabbath and have a good week. God bless. We'll see you next time here on Shepherd's Voice Magazine YouTube. Take care.